Good evening and welcome to the Coeur d'Alene Education Partnerships second annual State of the District Community Forum. My name is Nancy Hart and I'm the president of the Coeur d'Alene Education Partnership. We'd like to thank you for joining us tonight to be engaged in a public discussion of current topics in our school district. Your attendance this evening is a show of support for a quality public education in our local schools. We'd like to begin by thanking School District 271 for partnering with us on tonight's event. We'd also like to thank our business partner, Javon Sherman, for providing refreshments. Please help yourself to coffee and cookies at the back table. Thank you as well to Bunkhouse Media for filming tonight. Please check out the city's website at cdaid.org for a list of program times under the Channel 19 tab. The Coeur d'Alene Education Partnership is an independent nonprofit organization with the belief that every student in our district deserves a public education of the highest quality. We work to unite individuals, businesses, and organizations in support of an excellent public education. We also strive to keep the community informed about educational developments and to advocate on a, late, on a local and state level for superior public schools. In addition to last year's State of the District Forum, we hosted a school board candidates forum with the core group in April. We continue to build our volunteer program with over 70 volunteers in three local schools. Last year, CEP was awarded the a award by the Coeur d'Alene Area Chamber of Commerce and our volunteer program coordinator, Katie Clater, received the presti pres prestigious Citizenship Award from the Idaho School Board Association. We are honored to have our efforts recognized for, by these accolades. Our first speaker this evening from the Coeur d'Alene School District will be Superintendent Matt Handelman. Mr. Handelman will provide an update on our school district's performance. Safety and security enhancements will be presented by Chief Operating Officer Wendell Wardell and Director of Communications, Laura Rumpler. Our next topic for the evening will be the Idaho Core and Smarter Balanced Field Test presented by Director of Curriculum and Assessments, Mike Nelson. And joining Mr. Nelson this evening is Shauna Marshall, a fourth grade teacher at Sorensen Magnet School for the Arts and Humanities. Superintendent Handelman will then wrap up the evening with a discussion on the Coeur d'Alene School District's strategic planning process. We'd also like to welcome tonight in the audience our current school board members. Present this evening are Mr. Tom Hearn, Ms. Krista Hazel, and Mr. Dave Eubanks. Trustees Hamilton and Seymour passed along their personal regrets as they were not able to attend this evening. Good evening, my name is Jason Wing and I'm the Vice President of the Coeur d'Alene Education Partnership. I'd like to take a few moments to walk us through the format for tonight's forum. As Nancy indicated, we'll cover four key topics tonight. Each topic discussion will last about 15 minutes and will be followed by a 10 minute question and answer period. During each key topic discussion, members of the audience can write down questions directed to the topic speaker on the event brochure provided. Please raise your hand now if you still need a brochure um, or a pen to submit questions and a CEP member circulating through the audience will uh, bring the material to you. Note that questions related to a topic will be collected before the conclusion of each topic presentation. Because we may not have time to cover all of the questions asked during tonight's forum, questions will be grouped and prioritized based on interest and relevance to the topic. In the event time is still available after written questions have been posed, we'll open the floor microphone up for further questions, in which case we ask that you limit your time to 45 seconds when asking a question. We also ask that questions are short, concise, and directly relevant to the topics being discussed tonight. We also ask that there are no disrespectful outbursts or interruptions of the speakers or questions made out of turn. Without further ado, our first topic involves a snapshot of the district's overall achievement, which will be addressed by Superintendent Matt Handelman. Will you please join me in giving a warm welcome to Superintendent Handelman.
Thank you. Uh, thanks to Jason and Nancy and all of the CEP, uh, not just for tonight, but for all the work that you do with our, our kids and our schools. Um, we really appreciate the support and uh, thank you all, our board members and everyone in the audience for, for coming out tonight and uh, caring enough to know what's going on in our district. As I was introduced, uh, it says in the brochure that it's about our performance. And sometimes you think about performance just about you know, kids' test scores. And we're going to look at that just a little bit. But we're doing a lot of things as a district. We have a lot of success and a lot of things that we measure ourselves by. So um, as uh, you see this part of my presentation, you'll be seeing things that go much beyond uh, our, our testing. And uh, Mike and, and uh, Shauna will be talking a, a little bit more about our testing as well. So uh, just a little bit background about the district in, in general, in case you don't know. We are the sixth largest district in Idaho, uh, over 10,300 students. Um, actually, Mr. Wardell told me yesterday we're over 10,400 right now, I believe, yes. And uh, that's split up among 17 schools. Uh, those 17 schools uh, include uh, some magnet schools, three magnet schools. Shauna is, is a teacher at one of them two elementary and, and one at middle school. And plus, uh, we have a general um, policy of open enrollment on a space available basis. So when, when parents make their decisions about where to send their kids to school, it doesn't have to be right where they live. We also are lucky enough to be part of a consortium with uh, the Lakeland and Post Falls School Districts. Uh, the KTEC or Kootenai Technical Education Campus is up in Rathdrum, but we are actually 51% partners in that uh, cooperative where we have students from our high school, about 175 or so students from our three high schools who uh, attend half a day at, at the KTEC campus for professional technical uh, education and training. So we try to offer a, a comprehensive uh, array of offerings, both academic as also, also extracurricular. And uh, that bottom note is, there's just two words, but it's a huge part of who we are, the community support has been incredible. You know, I've, been, I've just been here for three and a half years, um, uh, and I've appreciated it, I've been wowed by it, but uh, I know that we've, we've really benefited from the support of the community for many years here in Coeur d'Alene in terms of being able to do uh, so many of the things that we do beyond what uh, the state provides uh, for a basic education. So uh, the first thing uh, you saw, I'm gonna be talking about our students and our schools. So our students are, are really what we're all about. And, and as I mentioned, one of the things that we measure our students on is, is uh, the, the uh, state testing. The ISAT is something that is, has sunset, essentially. We're, we've given our last Idaho standard achievement test. And uh, there are good things about that and bad things about that. We're moving on to something that we think is gonna be a, a more uh, accurate reflection and, and a, a more specific reflection of how our students are doing. But, uh, we've actually done very well with the ISAT over the years. This is uh, the fourth year running that the Coeur d'Alene School District, and this is comparing us to the uh, nine other largest school districts in the state, um, and we are the highest performing large school district in the state. Um, when you stack up our uh, ISAT language, math, and reading scores, and on top of that, another uh, adequate yearly progress measure, which is our high school graduation, that's the, uh, the gray bar at the uh, bottom and the bluish bar at the bottom. So you can see that we stack up uh, highest against all the highest uh, or the largest school districts in the state. We're very proud of that. As I mentioned, we're moving into some new times in terms of measuring things and trying to figure out what's the best way to show how our schools are doing. And there's an, a new uh, indicator from the state that's called the star rating system. And it's based on a system of five stars. And, uh, Basically, what the state uh, says is that if you're three stars or better, you're in good shape. Obviously, more stars, four stars is better than three, and five stars is, is as high as you can go. And we are very proud of the fact that we uh, not only have a number of five-star schools, but we also have um, no schools that are less than a three-star school. So uh, you can see uh, how each one of our schools rates on that scale. The difference between this star rating and the, uh, the ISAT achievement is that this not only takes into account achievement, but it also takes into account student growth, which is a really important factor because sometimes we can, take, we can try to take credit for students who come to us 
doing really well and then they perform really well, but we don't know whether we've had any value added to them. So this new measure um, uh, makes that a very important part of how we look at how our schools are doing. It also includes things like uh, graduation rate um, and also in the high schools, uh, it includes opportunities for some other kinds of courses than what you might think of as traditional courses. So it might be advanced placement courses, and it might be professional technical courses, but uh, other than the, the um, standard or general education offerings. Another thing that makes our district uh, really special and really incredible is our teachers. Uh, this is a picture, I was actually in, uh, this is Kim Canigliaro, who's a, a kindergarten teacher over at Winton. I was lucky enough to be in her classroom this morning, coincidentally. Uh, she is a lot of fun, you can tell by the look on her face, but she's a great kindergarten teacher. Um, and uh, uh, I, I'm astounded. You know, I've been here, I came from Washington, um, where I was an educator for about 15 years, and I've been here for three and a half. And what our teachers managed to do with a lot fewer resources and with a lot less is just really incredible to me, and it's heartwarming. And uh, the energy that folks go at it um, uh, with here is, um, is something that I think we take for granted. I think you all take for granted, and, and you don't really know it until you, you experience it somewhere else. Uh, this is something that we're very proud of. As you can see, um, this is Jamie Esler, who's a uh, science teacher at Lake City High School. He won the Idaho State Teacher of the Year this past year. He's not alone in our district. Over the last uh, 15 years, we've had eight of the State Teachers of the Year from our own district. There's something great going on here, if that's the case. And as I say all the time, it's only the tip of the iceberg. These are eight fabulous educators. Um, five of them are still uh, teaching in our district um, in, one, in one form or another, and uh, they are representative of the excellence that happens here. And uh, although their teachers are always shy about uh, standing up above the rest, these folks are pretty, pretty incredible. And I had the opportunity to, to talk with them all. I, I brought them all together um, a couple weeks ago to have a conversation about uh, their perspectives and some things that they thought we might be able to improve upon and seize upon from their, uh, from their areas of expertise. Our schools. Uh, this is another uh, thing that we're asking our community to measure us on because um, as you are probably aware, we passed a nearly $33 million bond um, uh, a couple of years ago now, two calendar years ago. And that's the largest bond that this district has ever passed. And we had a lot of projects ahead of us. And you can see some pictures here. The, the picture in the previous screen uh, was a picture of Sorensen, the before pictures of Sorensen. You can see the um, siding. And that uh, piece of land actually uh, has a, a structure on it now that you'll see in a sec. So these are uh, some pictures. There's, you'll get a more close up of the front of Sorensen's in the top right there and some of the construction that's going on. But you can see our uh, overall uh, efforts here. The five major projects from, from this bond were the five schools that are listed there, four of our elementaries and Canfield Middle School, uh, all sorely in need of updates. They're uh, mostly our downtown schools. All of them uh, were either overcrowded or had portables or both. Um, and. Uh, not only that, but the, just the learning environments were, um, were really run down in a lot of ways and inadequate in a lot of other ways. Now, in addition to uh, those five major projects, there were a lot of other projects that went on in terms of heat and ventilation, air conditioning at some schools, and other needed upgrades technology. Um, you'll see down below, there's also a maintenance and operations levy. That's what MNO stands for. And that's passed every two years. And uh, the bond was able to enhance uh, a number of things in terms of the technologies uh, as well, but we also have uh, our community supporting things like advanced learning programs and uh, remediation uh, for our students as well as activities and athletics. So the first featured um, school, Sorensen, where again, Sean is a teacher. Uh, you can see some before pictures here of both the outside and the inside. Uh, it's really hard to get a sense of how we change the learning environments. That was our number one 
uh, priority for the schools. But the, the biggest difference to me when I go into these newly renovated classrooms is, is really the lighting. Um, the, the lighting in the old classrooms was, was, uh, was there, but it was inadequate. Now the classrooms are bright, they have adequate storage, they have adequate um, insulation. The windows, if you ever went to Sorensen, say the first week of school when it was still summer temperatures, um, it was a sauna at best. So uh, we now have in, you know, double pane windows, we have proper window coverings in all of our windows, um, as well as uh, air conditioning, which didn't exist at that school before. Here are some pictures, uh, the new entry to Sorensen, uh, beautiful, they did a beautiful job of that, um, designing it. Uh, this, was, this one was designed by, all the elementary schools were designed by uh, Longwell Trap. This project was carried out by Gino Construction. On the right is the new, um, the new computer lab. They didn't have a computer lab before. Canfield was the next one that we, uh, we tackled. Canfield is now pretty much finished on the inside, a couple punch list items, but the outside, uh, if you drive by, you'll see that there, you'll, you'll see some pictures in a sec. We're not quite done, we'll have to finish up in the spring. But you can see the main reason that we felt like Canfield needed renovations was not just the overcrowding, which uh, made us have uh, six double classroom portables there, but also the fact that students were walking across an active parking lot during the day um, in order to get to and from classes. So in addition to just general safety issues of students having to walk outside, you know, dealing with the weather, the, um, days like today certainly, and also uh, with cars moving about. You can see the red is the new, that's our, our new second gym. You'll see a picture on the inside, I believe, in a sec. And the blue is the old. Uh, on the right is a picture of one of those new classrooms with the bright lighting, uh, all new furniture, new uh, cabinetry, new flooring, uh, new whiteboards, and obviously the, the technology is all up to date as well. So there's not a picture of the inside of the gym anymore, but that was one of the last things that got done. Bryan Elementary, our phase two, uh, has Bryan and Bora going right now. So if you've driven by either of those, you'll see uh, rising up from, from the ground, uh, this is the new gymnasium that's there. Uh, one of the things that, at both Bryan and Bora was that they had one room that housed gymnasium, uh, a multi-purpose room, a, um, the lunch room, and they couldn't run programs at the same time. So once kids had to start eating lunch, we couldn't have uh, physical education PE going on at the same time. Same was true at Sorensen. Uh, some of those rooms are also used for music classes and other things. So it's, uh, it's really uh, beneficial to the students to be able to, to spread out a little bit. On the right is a picture of uh, our new bus loop there, changing the traffic pattern, separating the cars from the buses. Again, safety precautions and makes it a lot more efficient, not just for the buses, but also for parent pickup. This is Bora Elementary. Uh, that portable um, is now gone. Um, there's foundation for two new classrooms at the end of that wing. And this is, again, a picture of, of the gymnasium rising up from the dirt. Um, amazing that we've gotten a lot of this work done during the inclement weather. We've been lucky with the, with the weather. The last one, uh, which is on our radar, is Winton. That's going to be going out for bid um, in April? March. March. And, um, You'll see a couple of things. First of all, on the right, you'll see a classroom corridor that there, there aren't separate corridors in a lot of this school. So students actually have to walk through one classroom to get to another classroom, sometimes through two classrooms. So you can imagine the interruption to the learning environment. Um, in addition to the poor lighting, the old, the old carpeting, all those things. But we, you know, we're adding, uh, at, at Bryan also, we're adding some exterior uh, passageways. However, uh, Winton itself is the oldest building in our district, and uh, it was discovered through the process of um, engineering and architects that really the, the um, foundation of that is inadequate. It's, it's not in good enough shape to rebuild on it. So we made a really tough decision. We had meetings with the community to uh, completely rebuild. We couldn't uh, renovate and remodel. It's a tough thing because it's a cute school. You know, it's got a little red schoolhouse look, and we're working closely with the architects uh, to make sure that we um, keep the flavor of that school for the neighborhood and, and re recreate some of the features on it uh, when we rebuild that school. Now, uh, I mentioned that, that um, Gino Construction wor was working on, uh, on Sorensen. 
They're also, uh, they're also doing uh, Bryan Elementary. Bora is uh, being done by uh, Contractors Northwest and Canfield was uh, TW, TW Clark. We're very happy to be able to spread out both the architecture work as well as the, the construction work and all the subcontractors to a number of different places. And that's the end of my section. So do we want to do questions now on anything that I've covered? Were there any that came in? Yeah, do we, we do have a few minutes for, um, for a quick question or two, if anyone. Um, we haven't received any written questions. If there's anyone who'd like to pose a question um, uh, utilizing the microphone, um, do that at this time. So it's great that um, the district has done very well on the ISAT, so congratulations on that. Can you share how we do on some of the national tests, how our students rank nationally, let's say on the SATs or eighth graders on the Ready Step uh, programs? Mike, do you want to do that? I can our director of assessments is here, so, so I, I want to make sure he, he probably has the information off the top of his head a little better than I do. I can certainly address it. Hi, everyone. Uh, we actually tow our own very well. One of the unique things about the SAT and the PSAT and the Ready Step, the Ready Step is an assessment that we are pretty much the only ones we give in the state of Idaho. So we're comparing ourselves there, but we're above the mean average on the Ready Step, and that is our first lead in to our college and career preparedness pathway. The first, the next levels in grades 9, 10, and 11, we give the PSAT. Now in terms of the PSAT in ninth and 10th grade, we are exceeding the state average and the national average. The only challenge with that is that we're not as exceeding as much as we would like to see. The reason for that is that we give that test not voluntarily. We ask every student to be able to take that test, where most school districts will offer it as an opportunity for students. So it's a little bit apples and oranges there. Uh, we also are, have not received all of the statewide data yet for the 11th grade PSAT, which was given to all students statewide. But we will have all of that posted at our state website. We're very confident that our career preparedness pathway is starting to move towards greater success on the SAT and then continue our trend into collegiate advancement. We are far ahead of the statewide average of getting students to college in the Coeur d'Alene School District, and we're hoping that the projects that we're doing continue to advance that. And in which assessment? In the read the questions on the mic. You can repeat it. I can I can repeat that. In which percentile were we? We're in the anywhere between the fiftieth to the sixtieth percentile in all of those assessments. Now again we can go through and take a look at each individual assessment and I all of that information is posted on our district website at cdaschools.org or I'll be more than glad to provide you individual reports that would be to that as well. Thank you. My pleasure. One of the points that, that Mike made that I think is really important uh, is that mm -hmm. w we'd be comparing apples to oranges if we were looking at, uh, say, sophomore year PSAT scores in our district nationwide, because nationwide students go in voluntarily to do that. And we have, as he said, everyone's taken it. So uh, we are very much looking forward to see what the state's SAT um, SAT scores are this year because that way we'll, we'll know how we're doing. We, as Mike said, we're not going to be satisfied ever. We're going to be always working toward getting better at that. But uh, in terms of us really understanding how we're doing compared to others, uh, we're still waiting to, to see some of that. Um, and, you know, we did take on before the state, we decided to start doing the PSAT for all of our all of our uh, juniors, sophomores, and freshmen. And the state has just picked up one of those this year they might catch up with us eventually in terms of realizing that in order to help these students be successful on the SAT in, in junior year, we want, we want to back it up and, and give them as many experiences and as much instruction toward it as possible going up to that. Okay, we are unfortunately out of time on this topic. Thank you, Mr. Handelman. Well, we will now move on to our next presentation for the evening, safety and security enhancements in our schools. This will be addressed by Chief Operating Officer Wendell Wardell and Laura Rumpler, Director of Communications. Good evening. Um, fair disclosure, I get a little emotional about this sometimes. So I have to stop and think. Um, I will talk about the infrastructure upgrades and Laura will 
we'll uh, discuss our crisis response and management, and then we'll finish with the human factor. Um, go ahead. What I want to do is walk through these. Uh, where find my tea here. Uh, I want to walk through these uh, diagrams here. After Sandy Hook, we started with perimeter fencing, and our overall goal was always to reduce the access to our buildings and the points of entry to our buildings and have people come into our buildings where we wanted them to come in so we could be prepared for them to come in. So the first steps were actually begun uh, the following uh, month. Uh, we had some open weather and we were actually perimeter fencing, changing our fencing and increasing it. And we will not be done fencing, of course, until we're done uh, with construction because we have fencing to take up with the three construction schools. Um, <laughs> video surveillance uh, was in our uh, radar screen uh, when we were passing the bond. And then the bond has been a big help to that levy because of the amount of cameras that we have been able to put in and around our buildings. Um, and talk just a little bit about that, but we're able to look all around our buildings all the time. Um, we're able to look down our hallways of our buildings, uh, and more importantly, the police are able to look into our buildings through our camera setup. So if an incident were to happen, responding officers would be able to see real time what was happening. Um, and they would be able to direct their response. As they've described it, one person would sit out in the parking lot looking at their computer and telling everybody where to go and when to go and how to go. Um, so video surveillance has played into that and we're nearly done tying those two together. The cameras are all in. Um, we're putting in our uh, SRO monitors right now in the various SRO offices through the secondary schools. At the same time we moved on to our school buses, one of the things law enforcement asked us to do was to number our buses on top so a helicopter could find them. So we did that. Uh, we put two cameras in every bus. We're adding a third, uh, but it's in the back of the bus, so it's a time-consuming process and takes about two or three hours per bus to put that third camera in. So we won't be done with the third camera until probably school out, but the other two cameras are already functioning and operating. We put in digital radios. What the digital radio does versus the analog is it takes out all the dead space that our bus drivers were confronting when they were traveling their routes. Secondly, it has a built-in GPS system and we have a software program that we can look at and tell where they are all the time. Thirdly, um, not only does it have the radios, but it has an emergency button that a driver can push and the software program on the computer screen immediately goes red and identifies the single bus where it is and it opens up a channel of communications with the bus driver without him ever having to do any more. So we have a quick access to the driver to understand what he's dealing with. Um, I'm gonna come back to the front door access because a lot of conversation on that and I wanna have some more. Uh, we have done some remodeling. Uh, both high schools have undergone a remodeling of their office configurations and locations actually uh, over the winter break and the idea was they were not positioned well to be able to see who was coming in the buildings and we wanted them to have direct eyes on that. Uh, and then the buzz-in system, uh, which is coming through the pilot program right now with Ramsey, Corlean High School, and Woodland. Um, and we're learning a lot. Uh, we will begin to roll this out through the district building by building uh, the 6th of February and we've learned that we need to roll it out building by building instead of rolling it out three buildings at a time, uh, which was, you know, it was a little exciting. Uh, but we had to learn, the, the whole program is driven uh, with computers. And we thought we had the programming right, and there was a, one programming step that the manufacturers said to Ednetics, our contractor, says, no, you can't program that way, you have to program this way. So we had to go back and reprogram. But you know, lessons learned, that's what comes out of that. Um, the microphone is there and the button to push, um, and that will connect you with our telephone system in our office, and a person will pick up and say, good morning or good afternoon, how are you, and what can we do for you? This part over here on the right takes this little white card and my code uh, and lets me into the buildings. Um, and so our staff all has that. Uh, and we have certain cards out with like SROs and so forth. Um, but that's part and um, parcel of this buzz-in system. It's been 
a great ride for three weeks and it's doing well now. Thank you, Wendell. One of the things I know Wendell's a little more humble about his background, but that Superintendent Handelman asked us to do in this venue this evening is share a little bit about our personal backgrounds so you can get to know us a little bit more and how we do our daily jobs and we bring our experience to the table to support the Coeur d'Alene School District. Wendell had many years of experience serving our country in the armed forces and did security and safety as well as in the private sector did a lot of security and safety. He and I are kindred spirits on this topic too as well and um, we really connect a lot when we talk about security and safety of our children in our community. A little bit about my background, I've had 18 years of experience in crisis management, communications, public information, and emergency management. My background is primarily public relations and communications in municipal government and county government. So I've worked for cities and counties. I also worked for a while in the hospital system in Spokane. I interfaced with emergency management in Oregon, Washington, and now Idaho. And I think, you know, I sort of thought about why was I drawn a bit to crisis communications or emergency management? I think part of it is my father was in the military and he was in communications and security in the Navy. And then unfortunately, I had a personal experience a few years out of college. I was in one of my first jobs in Spokane and I received a phone call from someone from the local news media and they said, we hear you're an alumni, you graduated from Thurston High School down in Oregon, correct? I said, yes. Would you like to comment about the shooting that happened at your high school today? I had no clue. And what had happened was in May of 1998, a 15-year-old named Kip Kinkle killed both of his parents the night before and then went the next morning into the high school, my high school, Thurston High School down in Springfield, Oregon, and ended up injuring 22 people and two people died. I have, it's never been the same for me going back to my high school. And so I think part of it is, is my commitment to how I operate on a daily basis to support our community is really personal to me. I also am a parent in our district. I have a kindergartner and I have a second grader in our district. And when I drop them off in the morning at school, I think about safety and security every day. I also am very privileged and honored to be one of 18 people in the United States to have been recruited, received credentials, and gone through the background check process to teach advanced public information officer training to people across the United States through FEMA and Homeland Security. So what that brings to the table as well back into our community is I get to learn a lot of the best practices. I get to be mentored by people nationally and internationally about safety and security and how to communicate in a crisis and handle a crisis situation. So one of the things I'm going to share a little bit more about bridging into the human factor of what we do. We talk a lot about our layers of security at our schools, the infrastructure, the things we've been doing since Sandy Hook that people can physically see. I'm going to chat a little bit about so you have a better understanding of what we do at a building level and what we do as a district-wide level with regards to SERP. And that stands for School Emergency Response Plans. Every building has one. And we operate here on that slide on the, the left-hand side is an incident command type of system. It follows the national um, emergency um, planning type of system as well. And what we do is we interface well with local law enforcement, our first responders, partners in mental health, public health, parents, the media, and then the school district and schools itself. So it's an integrated system that we plan for, prepare, and train on an annual basis. When I was in high school, we practiced fire drills. Now our students practice lockdowns, shelter in place, and other types of scenarios. And I will tell you, again, the more planning and the more preparation we do, we can't prevent tragedy. But when it comes to a tragedy, it's minutes and seconds that will help us have a lesser impact. And that's what we do. Our whole goal is to train staff and to have layers of infrastructure so that we can get through those seconds and those minutes until local law enforcement, our police officers, and our emergency medical first responders can come and help our students and our staff. We talk about preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation. Those are the four steps, or basically the cycle of emergency management. Where we live in the Coeur d'Alene School District a lot is this preparedness and response 
element to that model. A couple of things that we're privileged and honored to have in the Coeur d'Alene School District is an emergency communication system. I came to the school district three years ago and my very first question to the superintendent was, what is our parent emergency communication system? And her response was, we don't have one. And I said, we're going to have one. So we had the opportunity to partner with the Coeur d'Alene tribe and since 2012 we have had an emergency text, email, and call alert system that we can push out thousands of messages within minutes to our parents and to our community and that's called SkyAlert. So we're very honored again and privileged to have that partnership with the Coeur d'Alene tribe. We also use that as an opportunity with parent communications and then in the event of an emergency or crisis develop reunification plans and programs how we're going to communicate the message out to our parents and our community of what to do to help support us. We also have great relationships with the local news media too and use them as the avenue and outlet to help get meaningful, timely, and accurate information out to the public. That's our number one goal during a crisis. We are also going to be jumping in by the end of this school year to social media. Our superintendent, Matt Handelman, is going to start blogging this spring, and we are going to use Facebook and Twitter, both in non-emergency and emergency situations, to again get those messages out there. I am an older parent in our district. I will be turning 40 this year. I have the kindergartner and the second grader. But we have a lot of younger parents that are living in this space. So we are behind the times. We need to bring up ourselves up to speed as a district and start using social media um, to have it be a meaningful, timely response during communication, or excuse me, during non-crises and crises. Now I'm gonna shift over back to Wendell um, and he's going to share a little bit of more about what's unique in our community. But I have to tell you, on a monthly basis, I get phone calls from national news media as well as other school districts across our country saying, please tell me about your SRO, your School Resource Officer Program. How do you have it? How do you utilize it? And how has that helped you be a stronger system? One of the things that we've been uh, successful in doing is having a threat assessment team come into our district um, in early fall and do a threat assessment versus how we were heading in terms of our security system as we were uh, already out going out to contract. And the comments at the debrief was you're farther ahead than anybody. So pretty we, proud. We don't shy away from it. No, uh, these are our six current SRO officers. We have one at each um, secondary school, the three middle and the three high. Um, <coughs> we have just finished the screening and selection process. We were fortunate enough to be a part of both the Sheriff's Office and the uh, Coeur d'Alene Police for two more SRO officers that will come into our district in September and they will be focused strictly at the elementary schools. And this is kind of exciting. Uh, people say I use that word a lot, but it is exciting because there is no real elementary SRO program across the country right now. So we're in a position where we can evolve a program to make it look like we want it to look and make it work like we think it can work and we know it. We know it's the right thing. It's the, the people factor. I mean, we can do all of these gee whiz stuff that we're doing, but it's the teacher that meets somebody coming in our building that says, can I help you? or administrator. Uh, it's the parents in the community that listen and call in. It's our support staff. It's our bus drivers. It's the people part, the human factor, that makes this all come together and work. Um, we're going to be great. We're going to be safe. But we aren't going to be a fortress. Our community is still welcome. We want them in our buildings. When I was on the Board of Trustees in Billings, Montana, I built a high school built. I participated in the process of a high school and three elementaries, and we were always about, is it welcoming to the, to the community? And it seems strange to think a little differently. And just to chime in one thing before we take questions, we have developed an anti-bullying campaign that we're really working hard on this school year in the Coeur d'Alene School District. And our, our mantra there is stand up, speak up. Our mantra on safety and security is see something, say something. Correct. And that comes down to the students, the parents, and the community. 
I cannot tell you how many issues we have thwarted or how many issues don't come to light based on the quality work of those SROs developing relationships with the students in the building and those families and people out in the community really taking care of each other. If you have any written questions, can you please pass those to one of the board members, CEP board members circulating? And then why those questions are being collected, we do have a couple questions um, that we can ask. The first is from Lynn Wall. How will you minimize the issues with security with early pickups at schools? And I'm not quite clear what those issues are going to be, but every, oh, every uh, you're heading into our buzz-in system. Um, and I'm racking my brain. We did a debrief on Ramsey, and we didn't encounter a problem. Mm -hmm. So I'm not quite clear how to answer I, it. I, I think the way to answer it is, you know, sometimes we have parents rushing in late. And I will tell you, my husband has done this once or twice, a little tardy with the kids. <laughs> And um, they will go through the same buzz-in system process, announce who they are, bring their kids in late. I'm assuming the question is also to early pickup. If you're coming to pick your child up, let's say for a doctor's appointment or something else, you will no longer as a parent be able to freely just walk into that school, even bypass the front office and go to your classroom to find your child. You will, just like any other visitor in our system, buzz in, state your name, your purpose, why you're there, and then get into the school that way. Thank you. And we have one additional question. Where will Winton students be relocated during construction? Uh, Winton, Winton students are going to relocate as a school to Kinder Center up in Hayden, um, which is really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I say that in a great way because it does present challenges for us, um, which are fun. But we are working the process as far as busing, uh, transportation, times and so forth, um, but our plan, we, we're working with the city of Hayden right now as far as permitting for having the amount of traffic that we're gonna have up there, but we've already started to make the plan. The two principals that are involved have got a floor plan worked out, uh, have got plans in motion. It's kind of fun to just step back and watch them bring their schools together. But uh, yeah, Kinder Center for a year. Thank you. We have just a couple minutes. Does anyone have any questions that they'd like to approach the microphone? Yeah. Actually, can, sorry, for recording purposes, we need you to come to the microphone. Thank you. It doesn't, it doesn't pertain to this subject. It's from the last subject, if that's OK. OK. Um, or no. Or, or I know Superintendent Handelman is going to come and do a closure at the end. Maybe if you wouldn't mind holding that question until he comes back, and then we could do that. Would that be OK? Yes, thank you. You do. <laughs> <laughs> they want to record you forever. In regards to the SROs, is there any, uh, is there any additional finance coming from uh, the police department or anything, or is it all coming out of the school's budget? Um, it's coming from a school security levy to uh, equip the uh, uh, two SROs. We're uh, supporting them with the purchase of two patrol cars, one in the sheriff's department, one in the Coeur d'Alene police department. So their hourly or their salary comes out of your budget? But our SRO program is that way. Okay. Yeah, we budget for that. Okay. We do have participation from both uh, cities, but we all participate together, I guess, so we both pay in the cities. So, yeah, so for a point of clarification, we've had a fabulous partnership with the Coeur d'Alene Police Department, the city of Coeur d'Alene, where we co-share the, the funding of mm -hmm. those SROs. Mm -hmm. I hope I speak for everybody. I, I certainly appreciate all the safety considerations that you've implemented since Sandy Hook. But can you tell us whether you're in a position in 271 to repel a Sandy Hook attack? Soon. 
I say what, soon. What does soon mean? That's a pretty important a month, question. Within yeah, a month, we're rolling everything out by March 11th, and uh, we have one more layer that mm -hmm. I'm not really going to discuss yeah. that goes in. But yeah, we'll be in a position to uh, to deal with that. And let me just chime in quickly on that before we s go to the next subject. I know there was a lot of media attention about Sandy Hook, and there was a lot of attention about the tragedy, and I don't want to dishonor that, um, because trust me, as a parent of a child or two children that age, I mean, it, it took me months to even you know, stop thinking about it. What I do want to honor, though, is what wasn't said or wasn't shared that is now in the final safety and security reports that have been shared about Sandy Hook is the heroism, but the practice and planning of staff members in that building who did the right thing with regards to their lockdown procedures, the way they called 911, the janitor, the other staff members that I'm not saying it was Sandy Hook. I mean, Sandy Hook was a horrible tragedy for our nation in this world. It could have been a lot worse. Because of the school emergency response plan procedures that that school had trained for and that staff did helped save lives too. And that comes back to what we've been doing in our school district and we will continue to enhance those layers. We're never going to be perfect and as Wendell said, we're never going to be an absolute fortress but again, it's those multiple layers that we can do to help be the best that we can be. Mr. Wardell, Miss um, Rumpler, thank you very, very much. Our, our third topic involves an overview of the Idaho Core Standards and Smarter Balance Assessment, which will be presented by Mike Nelson, who's the Director of Curriculum and Assessment for the school district, and Shauna Marshall, who's a teacher at Sorensen Elementary. Thank you. Well, I, I have to tell you, though, Nancy and Jason, you've made it a little bit difficult. Uh, both Shauna and I understand a little bit about what's going on, but you're talking about two of the most important changes that we've seen in Idaho education. And you've given us 15 minutes to be able to do it. <laughs> We're going to do our very best. Did you find that there, Mrs. Rumpler? I have a slight technical No problem. Yeah, let's maybe go to full screen right there. Oh, it's having a fit. Let's just do the old reload. No problem. All right, we're on. Hi, everyone. Uh, like I said, you know, this is a, an interesting topic, and we've tried to do a creation for you called a Prezi that will hopefully allow you to see these two significant changes in a very unique way. Uh, so let's get into class. Everybody have your imaginary bell, or somebody can do one if you'd like. No? OK, thanks. Uh, I'm Mike Nelson. I am the Director of Curriculum and Assessment for Coeur School District. I have been with our district for 17 years, a Spanish teacher at Coeur High School for 12 years, and a principal at Coeur High School for four before moving to the district office. I am uh, proud also to be a parent in our district. I have a member of the class of 2025, a first grader this year, and then I'll have a member of the class of 2028 who's in preschool right now. My amazing wife and I graduated from Coeur d'Alene High School together in uh, 1991, and she actually continues volunteering with CEP as well. But I am also here with one of my heroes. This is Shanna Marshall from Sorensen Magnet School. Um, my name is Shauna, and I teach fourth grade at Sorensen. I've been with the school district for eight years, all at Sorensen. And I was with Sorensen before they were a magnet school and have just grown through that whole process of advocating for that school. And our, my whole heart is in Sorensen. As soon as I was hired at Sorensen, I moved my children over there. We were previously at Meadows, which is a wonderful school, but it was much easier to have your kids where I'm driving every morning. And so um, I have six children. All have gone all the way through the Coeur d'Alene School District. Three have graduated from Coeur d'Alene High School. And now I have three more. At the last three are at Coeur d'Alene High School. Uh, a, a, a sophomore daughter who luckily doesn't have to pass the <laughs> Smarter Balance to be able to graduate. I'm sure she will. But, and two sons who are freshmen there. And so we, uh, I have a lot invested in this 
program in this school district and in my own children um, between being in my classroom and also as a parent. So I'm very and glad to be here. There's a very strategic reason why Sean is part of this presentation as well in that she has helped develop both of the pieces that we're going to be talking about tonight. We're going to uh, take a look at both the Idaho Core and the Smarter Balanced into two different areas. We'll spend some time, first of all, talking about what Mr. Handelman's already talked about. We're very, very proud that we have mastered the ISAT. The Ooh. ISAT has been around for 10 years, and for 10 years, there's nobody who shined brighter than Coeur d'Alene. And partly, one of the things that we did multiple years ago is we really empowered our teachers. You've already learned about the qualities of our teachers tonight. So what we've done is we've tailored our instruction to meet the test. Now, the problem with that is that really the ISET is a minimum standard. What we are asking our students to do now, even though we've been able to master this for four years in a row, is do something totally different. And yes, we are the best large district in the state of Idaho, and we should be proud of that. But how do we really compare? The question earlier was, how do we look at a national norm? If you look at schoolpicker.com right now, they actually rank school districts, and Coeur d'Alene's number the one in Idaho. But they say if you go to Washington, your best school district is Mercer Island. And if you go to New York, your best school district is Briarcliff Manor. How do we compare? If our kids from Coeur d'Alene moved over to, to Seattle and went to a Mercer Island school, how would we compare? We don't know. We've never been able to compare that because every state got a chance to choose their standards. And because every state had a chance to choose their standards, they also chose their test. And so there was no congruence throughout any of the United States to say really where we're at. If you look at any of the media as well, you hear so much about Finland. Well, Finland does an incredible job with education, and the Finnish schools are number one in this and that. How do we compare? We now have an opportunity to be able to do that. And it's because we have a new set of standards. These new sets of standards were chosen by states, and currently 47 states have chosen them including the state of Idaho. Now, in this as well, we have a little vernacular change. We don't call them Common Core in Idaho. We've done a little bit of a seed change, and we call them the Idaho Core Standards. And that reminds us of one thing in particular. Idaho is in control. Idaho is a sovereign state who has adopted the Common Core Standards, but now Idaho has a chance to be able to change them. Just like the ISAT, it's a minimum standard. We can now put in things like cursive writing, like we've talked about in the state of Idaho, higher math standards, and we can add things to it. But again, we will have the ability to say what is what, because the standards are the same in all of those 47 states and districts. A couple of things. The word core in common core standards means it's consistent. It's across that level. But because of the fact that they're common core, that does not identify for us the curriculum. It's just the standards. So we are in control in the Coeur d'Alene School District of how we get kids to that standard. This amazing lady right here was one of our 40 teachers who helped us do that. And we'll elaborate upon that a little bit more. It does not dictate to us how we have to teach things. It does not dictate to us what textbooks and materials we have to have. And it does not dictate the values of our community that we have to be able to have. The standards come in two sections. Mathematics, which is pretty easy to be able to understand. It's a math book. And then what they've called English language arts standards. But it's also literacy. So we're talking about how do we teach reading, writing in all subjects. I was a world language teacher for years. How do the work of my students benefit literacy throughout the content areas? That is now part of our discussion. There again are the 47 states that have adopted these standards so far, again at a minimum. And this was actually done in the state of Idaho multiple years ago. So Shanna and several of our teachers started saying, you know what, there's an expectation in Coeur d'Alene that we achieve very highly. What are we going to do so that we don't have to turn on a switch in 2013 and say, OK, well, we're now teaching Common Core. So we've been working with this over this period of years. And there are several different switches and shifts that we've had to do over the last three years to be able to address this. And Shannon's going to take us through just a little bit of those. 
Well, it's been a pleasure to serve on many committees um, over the past three years trying to get the uh, teachers prepared, trying to get everyone's input and voice of all the professionals in our district. And there are many uh, shifts that are listed here, and they're kind of in some um, education ease, so those big words. But I'll talk to you just a little bit about what that shift means for me in my classroom. And I'll specifically start with ELA, and that's English Language Arts. And like Mike had said, it includes writing, it includes reading, it includes also speaking and listening and research and some technology and multimedia standards as well. So ELA is a, is a broad envelope and it, it impacts all of the other subject areas. For fourth grade, for example, a huge shift has been in the kinds of materials that we read. And by kinds of materials, I mean fourth grade typically was about 80% fiction and 20% nonfiction, or we call it informational text. And now the shift is to about 50-50. So we're reading a lot of rich literature, but at the same time we are also um, getting the kids reading things that they were going to see in their everyday life, the informational text, the nonfiction text that they love, by the way. <laughs> so that shift to more informational text has been fantastic. Um, close reading is a strategy that we are um, really addressing, being able to take all of that rich literature and all of that informational text and taking, having time to take really close looks at it. We might read um, one paragraph five times and really analyze that paragraph and have time to go much, much deeper with that paragraph. And so the close reading and the, the extent of the content material has is, is been greatly enriched. Research and technology projects, um, fantastic shift because we, as we have these, these grants and, and these things that are getting more technology into our classrooms, these kids are, they're digital natives. And we, for example, we just got some iPads into our classrooms this last couple of weeks at Sorensen. And a lot of the teachers have no idea they've never had an iPad or a tablet and they're not sure how to use it. I say, well, ask the kids. <laughs> If you don't know how to operate the iPad, ask the student. And I'm a technology leader in my building and also the webmaster, and I'm very tech savvy. And the kids are daily coming up to me, if you two flicks this way and one flick that way, you, you, know, you can get this new, OK, thank you. <laughs> so um, the kids are leaps and bounds ahead of us in terms of research. They have devices at their houses. They have them in their pockets. And they know how to get information. And so teaching them how to do that safely, how to find reliable sources, how to be able to critically think and analyze those sources, that research piece piece is a huge shift. Um, and the writing. We have spent, um, based on the standards that we had before, we had kind of a different approach. We spent a lot of time teaching grammar. And then you would hope to be able to spit out a writing piece as a result of that. And now we're doing rich writing projects and teaching the language through the writing. And it sounds like a small shift, but it's huge because what the materials that we're getting are, are greatly increased. And then quickly on the math, um, less concepts. There's actually a, a, a little, uh, some fewer math standards than we had before, but I'm able to spend much more time on, and they're terribly in interconnected. And we can't do the division and the area and perimeter this week if we didn't do the factors and the multiples last week. And so some great um, resources there. And the biggest shift I would say too is, uh, I have four words that we use all the time in the classroom now, is the stamina, the rigor. These kids have to persevere, and they have to um, make connections across all. So it's a fantastic shift for us. You know, the, the thing that's important is that if you look in a classroom in our district, we still teach reading, we still teach writing, we still teach math. However, the types of questions that we're asking students have changed. You're now going to see things like that on the board. I agree with what you're saying because kids are not only going to have to come up with an answer, they're going to have to defend it. They're going to have to do public speaking. They're going to have to use technology to do research to find out why is that the case. Throughout our district, you'll also see students doing technology projects, whether individually or facilitated by a teacher. All of these students here are working on an individual project based off of a single prompt, whereby they have different ways to be able to tackle a problem, similar to some of the uh, concepts that you brought in tonight mm -hmm. dealing with the Renaissance. Students are being asked to, again, uh, come up with creative ways to tackle a situation or an idea. But please raise your right hand if you've heard how bad Idaho education is on the radio. <laughs> it's a challenge. There's a lot of change going on here. And part of the concern about this particular campaign is that it talks a lot about college and career preparedness and what, that our kids are not going to college enough. Well, the Common Core actually tries to address that as well because they have addressed 
how these shifts in education, in English language arts and mathematics, are going to be ramped up incrementally, year and year and year and year, so that students do get the opportunity to go to college and they do get the ability to share what they can do. But Shanna also is, again, my hero, because like she said, she volunteers for a lot. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> but my pleasure. Again, over the past three years, we have worked with teams of teachers who we've called our top 40 to redesign what we teach and what we learn from our students as we're doing this project. This lady here has been incremental in our fourth grade team in writing brand new curriculum, brand new units, brand new assessments, all for kickoff this year, which is certainly a challenge, but our kids are being persistent and they're being resilient and we're working through those processes. And one of the catalysts for the top 40 was I, um, did an application process two summers ago to, uh, and applied to be an SBAC or the Smarter Bounce, um, a writer, an item writer. And I was very excited about the opportunity to be a part of this new um, chapter in education and to really be able to have a voice for Idaho and for teachers with the Smarter Balanced process. And so um, I was accepted for that and it was an exciting way to spend my summer. My family didn't think so, but it was, it was a lot of fun for me. And I went through uh, extensive training to be able to be an SBAC writer, a Smarter Balanced writer. And we had lots of training on things like universal design and bias and adaptability and making sure that this was an authentic, enriched test. And one thing that I was most impressed by was the fact that I got to work with a team of nine teachers from around the country. And we were placed on a team and we were each assi uh, assigned the task of writing 50 to 60 items according to stories. And it's been fun as we uh, have the sample, uh, the iPads to be able to take some sample tests. Some of my story prompts are in there for the fourth grade ELA, so it's fun to see it come full circle. And my team consisted of teachers from Washington, Louisiana, North Carolina, Hawaii, that was a really fun one. And um, to be able to work with teachers and to really have the teacher's voice heard in the assessment process was, was very exciting. So it was great to be able to have that background knowledge and spend that whole summer writing and learning best practices for assessment and best practices for preparing for this test and then to be able to bring that back and share that and have the district use that as a way to get all teachers the information they needed to help their students be successful. We believe so. in transparency. We believe that the work of our teachers needs to be front and center to you because we only get the chance to have your students for six and a half hours a day. Yeah. There are 24 hours in a day and we need to be communicative with you as to what your students are being asked to do and we put everything available for you up on our website and it should have been handed out to you for a patron or a student of our district as many times as you want. You can go to our district website right in the middle in my badly circled red there. Click on departments and under that is curriculum. You'll be able to get any document that you want talking about what we do in any of our classes. All of the curriculum guides, the links and everything available right there for you. So that talks about step number one. I hope we're doing okay on time. Okay. We'll move to the big one, which is the Smarter Balance, because if there's a change in standards, there's a change in the test, the assessment. And the new one is a horrible, S, uh, is a horrible acronym. The acronym is SBAC. Okay? We're just going to continue to refer to it as Smarter Balanced because it sounds a lot better. Uh, but the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium uh, involves 27 different states. Idaho is green on this map, which means that we are in one of the driver's seats. We help to create this test. And I'm on an advisory panel with our uh, state uh, assessment coordinator, Dr. TJ Bliss, and we're going back and forth and saying, what should kids be asked to do on this assessment? The test is going to take longer, and this is one of the knocks of the test. But when you see the types of things that students are going to be doing on the test, you'll see why it's a longer test. There are four different elements, English language arts and math, two tests each. One is called a performance task, one is called the computer adaptive, and we'll talk to you about each one here in just a second. Each of these tests are going to test a student's rigor and knowledge comprehension level to a much deeper level than what we've done before. The ISAT identified what is the one possible answer of these four choices. This is an example of what's called, uh, I can't even think of it, a selected response. Whoa. <laughs> whereby a student is going to say, well, what are the properties of a rectangle? And a student is going to have to mark every one of them correct to get full points. It's right or it's wrong. There are technology-enhanced items. 
Were you still working on that one? <laughs> you have three hours for this question. <laughs> Don't worry, we're going to give you a chance to take the test here in a few moments, too. So. There's technology enhanced. So again, a student is going to have to take their mouse and drag and drop or draw a line of axis. All of those different elements are coming into play. A student is going to have to read a prompt and type, beginning in as little as third grade, a student is going to have to make a response via keyboard to answer a prompt. Additionally, one of the unique ones is this one. It's called a performance task. Isn't he cute? <laughs> Students get information in a classroom. This information is consistent throughout all of the Smarter Balance states. It tells the teachers, watch this video clip. Take a look at this article. And then students gather all of this information before they go into the computer lab and get their question. This is an example of a robotic task and how robots can help people. So they would watch that as an example. There's the prompt on the left-hand side. And again, the student is going to have to elaborate to that level to be able to get points. It's all rubric-based. Much different than what we were used to before. Because in the past, all multiple choice. It was written at a minimum proficiency. And it was clearly defined by the standards. Now we're getting to the point where it's adaptive. It's going to change difficulty. If Shanna's students at Coeur d'Alene High School answer a question right, the next question will be harder. Mm -hmm. And if they get the question wrong, it'll ease a little bit because it's trying to find that equilibrium of where that student's skill set is. All of those different types, performance tasks, and again, nine of our teachers were hired by the consortium to help write these questions. So if you don't like one of the questions, please send your email to Shauna Marshall at Sorensen Magnet School. I'll get back to you immediately. Exactly. But challenge, there are no results for our district this year. We will not know how an individual student did, how a school did, how our district did, or anybody in the state. Those are going to be held at the state level under lock and key or whatever they're going to do with them. And the whole purpose of that, this is a field test. This is a test to test the test. It's an opportunity for students to see what they're going to be asked to do. It's an opportunity for them to test to make sure that all of the tools and bells and whistles hit. Because next year, it becomes official. Our first official results come in next year. So the star ratings that Mr. Hamilton, Hamilton. Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> that Mr. Handelman talked about will remain in place for two years. But we are going to be talking to our kids after every test. And we are going to be learning from them and finding out, you know, what did this feel like to you? Was it harder, easier? Was it about what you expected? So that we can make sure that our system is fully aligned. But the current freshmen, poor people, the class of 2017 will be the first class required to pass all four of those tests to graduate in the state of Idaho. And as a result of this field test, they're going to now establish the cut score of what a student is going to have to achieve to be able to do that. So we'll have that information, but we won't necessarily know how our kids did. We kick this off on March 18th. We finish any time in the window May 16th. Teachers can assign students to test any time throughout that entire window. So there they are. There are the elements with the differences the ISAT the important dates and preparing our students. Hopefully we stayed somewhat on time. I think we did good. <laughs> you can go to our district website again, right under the department's heading, choose assessment, and there's a Smarter Balance window over there. In fact, we even brought for you tonight some iPads so that you can log in and you can see specifically what your students are going to be asked to do. This is an open source test. The blueprints for the test are available. You'll know exactly what kids are going to be asked to do in different areas. We just don't know the question yet. But that's a nice thing because the ISAT was in secrecy. We had no idea. Mm -hmm. Now we have a way to prepare to be able to use our incredible teachers to be able to make sure that our students succeed. So it's time for your questions. W once again, if anyone has any written questions, please raise your hands, and those will be collected um, in the interim. Uh, I have one question to start it off with. Go ahead, Jason. Um, where are sample answers found for the sample SBAC that's been released already? They are on our district website. They are also available on the consortium page. If you go to our district website at cdaschools.org, choose departments and assessments, you'll be able to take the sample test. 
but you will also be able to see examples and answers and the level of difficulty as to how they would be scored. And again, we're using those types of elements right now in the classroom mm -hmm. so that we can measure up and look at what kids are doing to say whether they would be accepted or not. Another question we've received is, who is grading these longer responses on the SBAC? Well, right now, it is by two different elements. Number one, it's going to be graded by artificial intelligence. So the computer is going to be looking for keywords and expectations. In addition, the state of Idaho is going to be moderating that. So they're going to be choosing Idaho teachers. Probably Shannon will get to be one. She'll be able to look at random at fourth grade responses and make sure that the test is leveling correctly. I'd like to add something to that as well. Every question that we had to write, we had to, the, the question was actually the easy part of the assessment writing. The rubric was the difficult part. And we had to be able to give examples of what a full, a full score, a medium score, a zero score. Anything that um, during our training that we were told, and I'm not sure if it's changed, but anything that didn't receive full score based on the computer intelligence scoring would have a human eye look at it. Correct. Here's another question we have. Um, can the district or the state set any cut level they want for graduation? That is true. Uh, as part of the consortium, the state of Idaho can set its cut scores wherever it would like. However, let's keep in mind that 27 states are doing that as well. So there is a little bit of a political pressure as well as to where the state of Idaho may put their scores. But it will be arbitrary to our state. We don't know what they're thinking, but we certainly hope that they uh, set a cut score that is going to allow students to, ex to achieve. Uh, one of the things that we have heard from the state is that they will probably do a ramp up, similar to what we saw in Idaho. They'll probably set a standard and then the next year increase that standard a couple of points, increase the standard a couple of points until they feel that it's at an adequate level. Here's another great question. How is the district preparing the younger, quote, first through third <laughs> graders for the SBAC computer-based questions? Do you want to address that? I would love to address that. Sorensen is so excited to have a computer lab. Um, we are working, starting in kindergarten and first grade, just starting to prepare these kids. They are already, um, we actually started with the primary kids in terms of getting them ready for the math and the ELA standards. And this year, fourth grade's getting a, a much more intensive training and, and it's going to signal up so we, we can get these kids ready from a very young age. Um, so we are working with the primary teachers, intermediate and primary, working very strongly together to build this foundation. And it, it's wonderful, the, the primary, um, for example, the primary kids started last year with the math. And as I'm getting fourth graders this year, I'm noticing huge increases in certain areas that are very helpful, like place value and number sense and things. And so that's rolling over, starting with the younger kids and moving up with the, the increased rigor. Also, we've got those little kiddos with their fingers. We're working on the keyboards. And as you saw in the Sorensen um, computer lab picture, the, the large keyboard, we've got kindergartners who are working with mouse programs and um, all sorts of things to get them used to the technology. And like I said, uh, my two-year-old granddaughter can operate our iPad. So these, these kids are digital natives, and they, are, um, they just need to increase their stamina and get those skills that they need for the keyboarding and understanding the even little words like drag and drop and keeping those little vocabulary words in front of them. And, and they get it pretty quickly. They're, they're amazing. They do. Just one more question. Uh, will we be adjusting the timeline of the test so teachers have a full year um, to instruct? We uh, are not in control of the uh, windows that we're given. Uh, I will tell you that we're fairly lucky in that we complained to the state. We originally only had a four-week window to test about 7,700 students in our district. And that's just going to max everything out. So we actually asked for an additional four weeks, and they granted it to us. Uh, if we use, the state of Idaho uses the full window of Smarter Balanced, it is actually a 12-week window to be able to test. And of course, everybody wants to test at the very end of the school year. I think that would be more important when we were dealing with ISAT because it's so factually based. But now in this type of test, it's more logic. It's really going to depend more on the classroom activities that a student is doing. But the types of interactions that a student is doing in the classroom is going to mirror what they're going to get in Smarter Balanced. Mm -hmm. And it is a language and it is a process that we've been going through since September. So getting the kids used to the academic vocabulary and the kinds of thinking and the kind of products that we want them to be able to produce, they're, they're doing leaps and bounds above my expectations. They're doing amazing. 
So start, it started in September. <laughs> Excellent. Does anyone have a question they'd like to pose from the microphone? Yeah. How are you tonight, Fred? Good. Uh, two things. Um, you mentioned the departments to get information. Um, I don't know if you guys know what's in there, but uh, it's called Parent Guide. And the Parent Guide allows you to see, let's say, what fourth graders are doing in the classroom in a given week and what the parents might do uh, to help them. Okay? But my problem with that is uh, I think there should be an icon on the first page of your website that says Parent Guide because what parents are going to know besides the ones that just heard from you to look under departments and then it's three links away from that. So I'd like to see an icon right on the first page, right to the parent's guide so they, you know, get an idea what they're looking for. Okay, the other question was, yeah, I think the Idaho Corps or whatever is gonna be great, but I have a question on the impl implementing of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see where the first graders and the, the children are just starting school. Mm -hmm. They're going to go through this whole process but this is implemented all the way through, right? That is correct. Now, what I'm interested in knowing is how are the, let's say, high school students dealing with a change when they haven't had the experience of it going all the way up? It's a wonderful question. It was actually one of our greatest concerns because it's, think of your seventh and eighth graders. They've had years and years of instruction at this consistent level, and now they're expected to turn the switch and do this incredible work. The same type of ramp up that we've seen in grades K, 1, 2, 3, now that Shana is getting it, has been occurring in 5, 6, and 7. And since you have high schoolers, you can probably even address it as well. Uh, I, there is an incremental shift in how we instruct to be able to get to this point. And that shift of instruction has been occurring gradually over the last several years. And it is, it's a great question. I. My, my personal experience with that is, you know, having the, the uh, Smarter Balance background and being on all these committees and helping with this whole process at the elementary level, it's been very interesting to me to see my, my boys bring home their work from their freshman classes at Coeur d'Alene High School. And I'm so excited about what they're doing. So those, those and I'll just speak to the English teachers because it's the one that I pay the most attention to. Um, they're, they're doing, the ninth graders are doing the same, um, I'm hearing the same language and the same processes through their lesson assignments that I'm doing with my fourth graders. It, now, it, granted, it's a, a much higher level and their content is much more complex, but I think they're doing a fantastic job. My, my, all three of my high schoolers have felt an increased rigor. I mean, they're definitely being stretched and pushed in the, in, in, in the writing area especially, but they, I think the teachers are doing a great job. We have not struggled as a family other than getting them to get their work done. <laughs> And Fred, if I can address probably the first part of your question was as well, in the month of February, we're going to be doing a little bit more of a barrage around Smarter Balanced. And of course, the Idaho Corps ties into that very well. But we're going to be doing a series of road shows across the district that goes building to building to building to building, giving parents an opportunity to be able to see the test, take the test, and ask additional questions with that. And that kind of communication piece will be adjusted to make sure that it is very clear what the shifts are that we're doing and why it's important. Do you know you had a question as well? Um, I'm going to make a broad assumption, but due to the fact that most of the kids are going to have to take a computer-based test in third grade, mm -hmm. when we already know sort of the socioeconomic makeup of our district, how, are, how is the district going to help the kids that don't have computers at home or access to technology get the time on the computer that they're going to need to be able to successfully take those tests? Well, a great example is as one of my responsibilities as the director of curriculum and assessment, I help with textbook orders. Well, we're not ordering as many textbooks now. We're bringing in more devices. Uh, we just ordered 275 new iPads for Hayden Meadows Elementary. Part of it is we have to get the devices in kids' hands, and we have to give them real activities that mimic what they're going to be asked to do. So those types of things are there. We are also in the process right now of working with our trustees for a brand new bring your own device policy where we are moving away from this, uh, this don't bring your device into the classroom, but teaching our teachers and our students how to respectfully use them in a classroom so that they can, again, mimic those types of experiences. So, 
can I ask this question? So if the kids are, some kids are going to be able to bring their own personal um, iPad or what mm -hmm. have you. Are we going to be able to have some sort of checkout for the kids that, I'm seeing some nodding over there from Mr. Handelman, Superintendent, thank you. Um, I just wanted to see, because if, if my kid doesn't have a computer, how do I make sure that they are able to use the keyboard and work on it the way that they're going to need to click and drag and mm -hmm. all the things they're going to need to prepare for. So yeah, thank you for answering my question. Not a problem. The most wonderful part is that the technology is becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So it allows us to have that economy of scale to do that. The other thing is there are many devices uh, that are recycled, thrown away that really could be beneficially used by a student in our district. We just had a conversation with Verizon Wireless a couple of weeks ago about how we might be able to get some of those good quality devices into our classrooms and give them to a student who can use them to be able to benefit themselves. And as always with, um, especially between teachers and families, the, that partnership is so um, magical and, and, and important to the educational process. I work with a lot of parents of students who don't have computers and won't, teachers or meet them before school or after school to get into the lab. In addition to our assigned computer lab time, we also have made sure that every available block of time for the computer labs is, is open and available for us to sign up and get in. So instead of just getting in maybe once a week, I'm now getting in twice a week or three times a week. And so we're just really working together. Um, and just one other facet of that is I'm also the tech leader for our building. And so we had a great technology meeting yesterday where the district has really um, done a huge survey and I took it as a parent um, three times. <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> But getting the, their, their thumbprint right on the pulse of what is the technology in this district. And so if you're a parent in the district, you might have taken it. But there's some amazing data there that we're able to look at. And we spent uh, three hours yesterday looking at that survey, those survey results. What percentage of kids have access to devices? Who has home computers? Who shares those? Who can get them you know, at um, home? And it, it's a much higher percentage than you would think have access to devices. Um, homes that may, um, may suffer um, econo uh, socioeconomically in other areas, they're having devices now, so yes. even smartphones. And so figuring out how we can best support kids in that. Yes, sir. Hello. Hello. Um, what type of accommodations will you have for the new testing if computers are not really combat compatible with the child taking it. So, uh, in other words, I sat, it's my understanding, it's the computer or nothing. Yeah, on the ISAT, there were five possible accommodations to meet a student's needs. On the Smarter Balance, there are 27 different accommodations mm -hmm. to meet a student's needs. Uh, for instance, one of the big ones, because there's so much typing involved, if a student has an accommodation in a classroom that allows them to have text to speech, or speech to text, excuse me, backwards, then that can be an accommodation on there. There's visual accommodations. There's everything from Braille to having a scribe to all kinds of different things. And a student's team, if, they're, if they qualify for an IEP or 504, a special education or a health plan, uh, then that accommodation will be granted to them on the assessment for the purpose of that need. Uh, that sounds very good. Uh, is there a list somewhere of the accommodation types? Sure. I don't think that's actually posted on our district website, but if you'll stick around for just a few moments, I will send it to you personally. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. We are out of time on this topic. Thank, Thank you, you for a great discuss discussion, Mr. Nelson and Ms. Marshall. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Our final topic of the evening, presented by Superintendent Handelman, will be an overview of the school district's st strategic planning process. It is. Uh, <laughs> I was actually told, you know, I was sort of set up for this one because I, the strategic planning, I, I will get to that. I was, I, you know, Laura actually said to me, well, uh, people want to know sort of what's your vision for the district? And, um, in order to understand my vision, it's important to know a little bit about my background, too. But um, it's also important to know that, that although my vision is important, my leadership is important, my style of leadership isn't one that it's all about my vision. As a matter of fact, our, our school board have been the drivers of our strategic planning process. So um, it, it has to be a group effort where it starts with our school board, our, our staff, 
our community has to shape what our school district's all, all about, because as was mentioned a while ago, um, I think by Mike, uh, is that, that our school district needs to reflect our community and our community's values and what we want for our kids and for our future. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am uh, from New York, just north of New York City. Uh, my, actually, my best friend in college from New York City, when I, said, when I told people I was from New York, he said, no, you're not. I'm from New York. You're from the suburbs, right? So, but um, uh, I grew up there. I, I was lucky enough to go to the public schools. Uh, I, I live in the same community, not far from Briarcliff Manor, where Mike mentioned before. Um, but I, I kindergarten through, through uh, 12th grade, I, I went straight through um, in the public schools, great school system. And uh, it's funny, it says small colleges. I only went to one small college. I went to college in Western Massachusetts. Um, and also, uh, I went to uh, University of Washington and uh, Washington State University to get my uh, uh, credentials as a principal and as a superintendent. I guess the other small college I went to was for my master's degree. I went in Portland, Oregon. Um, but I, I've, I've had a wide array in lots of parts of the country. Um, and uh, since graduating, I have spent my entire career, my professional career in education, over 25 years in education. I've been a teacher uh, for about eight years. I was a principal for, I believe, 14. And I uh, was the associate superintendent for three years um, before becoming the superintendent, the interim superintendent, now the superintendent of the school district. So um, I, I worked in, in both public schools and private school, schools as well. So um, uh, you, you can tell I'm pretty dedicated to, to what I do. Um, my own parents, um, were not educators, but uh, obviously they valued education a lot. And um, they were also, another thing they valued a lot was, was public service. Um, they were both very involved in their community and the greater community and some national uh, efforts, historic preservation, for example. And, and um, so they taught me about wanting to be um, uh, someone who gives back to the community. And I feel like I do that through my career. Um, I'm married. My, my beautiful wife and best advisor is sitting in the audience. And, um, and I'm also the father of three who actually live in Spokane um, from a previous marriage. Um, so I'm busy with uh, some kids of my own, uh, in addition to the 10,400 kids I have here in Coeur d'Alene. A few things I enjoy doing when I find the time. Uh, uh, road biking. Uh, I enjoy reading, uh, when I, again, when I can find the time. Sometimes I, I do the professional stuff. Sometimes I, I just try to get lost in a novel. And I'm a big sports fan. Y'all be watching the Super Bowl. I still follow my New York teams and the Seattle teams, but uh, uh, you know, I'm listening to sports radio probably too much in the car uh, when I'm in the car. More about me. Um, I, I'm part of what's called the uh, Idaho uh, Superintendents Network this year. Um, and lucky enough to get a little extra professional development for myself. Um, I say lucky uh, because, um, as you see, I found that one of my strengths through that is as a learner. Uh, that we, one of the things that we did was, was read this uh, Strengths Finder book and, and do a, a, a test. All you need to do is buy the book to do this test. Sort of interesting to see how do you build up your own strengths. And you can see some of the things about me. Um, the achiever part, uh, if you read the part about that, is that my work is never done and I'm probably uh, not sleeping very much. It, it nailed me really pretty well in terms of uh, figuring out who I am. Um, but uh, the relator and the individuation have to do with uh, the importance that I place on uh, relationships and, and working with people. Um, so uh, you can see here, I, I mentioned about my parents, this part about servant leadership. Uh, some of the things you're going to see are something, some things that I shared with, with the uh, entire staff. We have this back to school breakfast when all uh, 1,000 or 1,200 uh, staff members in our school district get together. And, and I talk to them about what I see as importance of servant leadership. That although I'm the leader, I, I'm also a servant to all the people who work in the school district, to every parent, to every kid. And I really believe that, that I, I'm here to help make things make things better, make things easier, to answer questions, to, to help people along. Some other of my own core beliefs, which, which help shape who I am and how I lead, um, there's, there's a lot out there about teaching. And there are definitely things that we can learn from each other. I mentioned to you that I talked to the T Idaho State Teacher the Teachers of the Year. Um, 
and to try to learn from them. But it's not so easy to replicate what's in education. You know, you know that there are some great things going on. Um, but uh, if there were one way to do, do everything, everyone would be doing it that way. And if there was an easy way to replicate what an individual teacher or an individual school does, we'd be doing that. Um, and part of the reason for that is that there's a certain art to what, what happens in the classroom. There is some science, and we can all learn and get better at what we do. But uh, I believe strongly that teaching is, is this uh, strong combination of both uh, science and art. The next line, I think communication is incredibly important. You can't communicate enough, and uh, that's two-way communication, both listening and letting, letting other people know what you're thinking, letting the public know what we're doing, such as this event. Uh, but uh, I don't think there's much of a substitute for that. I uh, don't want to keep people in the dark. Another one of my uh, strong beliefs is that we need to both keep our, your kids, our kids safe, and also consistently challenge and push them to that next level. Um, and, and the environments that we try to create in each one of our schools uh, need to be that way, and, and that's something that, that I believe strongly in. The next bullet just has to do with, with making sure that we are, we are moving along with the times. Laura mentioned that I'm going to be starting to blog. I do already have a Twitter account. I know Ma Maureen actually recently follow, became a follower of mine, although she doesn't have much to follow because I haven't been using it very much. But she will. But uh, that's, you know, I, I believe in, in modeling as a leader that I need to be doing that. As Laura said, that we have a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of parents not, and kids, obviously, in our district who that's their main mode of communication. We have to keep up with those times. We have to be, make sure that we're providing as best as we can uh, to our students in school, but also uh, the things that we do um, as a school district. I always want to be accessible. Um, my wife will tell you that I'm probably too accessible to, to folks sometimes, but I, I believe that's part of the servant leadership. Um, uh, and I always want to be as positive as I can about what we're doing um, and about the, the possibilities for us in the future. Uh, a phrase that I really, uh, really like and I've, I've used over the years as an educator and a leader is uh, the idea that we have to have high expectations. I have high expectations of myself, high expectations of others, but if I have high expectations of others, I have to also support them. So high expectations have to go along with high support. So that's for adults and kids as well. A few other things that I shared, uh, that back to school breakfast I mentioned with the staff, things I believe strongly in. You heard Mike say before to the gentleman who was asking about the accommodations for students on the test, I'd be happy to get back to you. I love hearing that. That's the kind of response that I hope that you get from every person who works in our school district, starting with me and going to anyone, uh, anyone in our school district. And you won't always get the same level. Mike's especially great at that. But really, um, uh, I believe in customer service, and it starts there. You are our clients. You are, you are the people who should drive what we're doing, and we need to make sure that we're meeting your needs as best as we can. Um, another piece that I share with the staff uh, just has to do with uh, this idea of the fact that we're all dependent upon each other, and we're also all individually accountable for what we do. And those things go hand in hand. Um, uh, and, and again, th that, that idea of us being a team, uh, us within our school district being a team, all the people who work for us, and also us being a team with our community and with every person who's out there in terms of um, how, again, can we make things better as best as we can for the kids as they come through our school doors. Uh, this is a book that inspired me um, a couple years ago. I read it. Um, it's about actually a, a group of schools called the KIPP schools. They're, they're sort of a, a, uh, like charter schools. Um, in a variety of communities, but they have this phrase that th they think everything boils down to, and I think it's a really uh, apropos one for, for any school district, for any organization, and for any individual. Um, and so I encourage uh, people I work with to do those two things, just work hard and be nice, and, and uh, we'll go far doing those couple of things. Um, Dave Eubanks in the back, back, I know he appreciates this, the title of this sl slide about continuous improvement. Uh, I hope you've heard that in the things that I've been saying, that we can always get better at what we're doing. Um, there's always room in every individual uh, to get better at what he or she is doing, um, and us as a system as well. True with kids, true with adults, that we're always striving to do better. So uh, some of you who are in the business world might know this book uh, by Jim Collins, 
called Good to Great, and something I read uh, back in my um, superintendent training. Um, I, I haven't authored this book yet, but um, that's what I s challenged the staff with uh, <laughs> this year. Uh, we are, uh, we're writing that as we go along. So this idea of continuous improvement, as I said, is really important to me. Uh, another phrase, I only gave you part of that, uh, tell me what I need to hear. The other half of that is not what you think I want, what, what I want to know. Tell me what I need to know, not just what you think I want to hear. So, I, you know, people can say, oh, you're doing a great job and, and we love the schools, but I really need to hear from you. I need to know what people are thinking out there. And so we've been out trying to gather information. Part of this was at the board's behest in our strategic planning. This is how you can get a hold of me. Um, I, I'm uh, very accessible, as I said, by email. Uh, that's my work number. And I will, I will get back to you if you, need, uh, if you need a question answered. And I will try to find answers for you if I don't know them myself. Sometimes I do uh, pass it along to someone else because my time is limited. Um, but I always want to uh, provide you with that customer service. So as we uh, go into the future as a school district, um, it's all about our kids and preparing kids for the 21st century. That's another one of our state teachers of the year. That's Katie Pemberton, who's a math teacher over at um, uh, Canfield Middle School. And um, uh, as you can see, you can just see the, de the dedication on her face and, and the individualization that she's doing there. But what we're trying to do right now uh, is launch into this improvement effort. Uh, you can see this arrow pointing up in the, right, in the direction of the top right of that slide where um, what I shared with, this, with each staff, we've gone around to every staff, we're now going to community organizations, um, showing that what we're trying to do is not just make sure that these messages are out here. You know, we, we deliver a lot of information out there. You might read things in the press, you might think, read things on our website, your si child's uh, classroom newsletter, whatever it happens to be. A lot of messages. We want to make sure, especially within our organization, that everyone not just hears the message but understands the message, uh, that they're motivated by it, and then take action uh, in concert with what that message is. And there are a lot of things, you know, you've heard about a lot of things that are going on in our school district tonight. It's really only the tip of the iceberg. I and mean, there's so many other things that, that take up our time and our attention. Those are some of the big picture ones. But with all these things going on, we want to make sure all our, of our arrows are pointing in the same direction. We all have the same goal. So we're really trying to be clearer on what our mission is and what our vision is of the future. Um, you can see what the idea of having everyone's head and heart engaged in what we're doing. But what we've asked every organization, uh, when, when we've gone out to different Kiwanis clubs and, and Rotary and, and other groups in the community, when they ask us to come and talk, is we've asked them these couple of questions. And the board has actually read through. The, every every uh, one of our school staffs have been asked these questions. They went out to the transportation department the other day and maintenance. And, and we're gathering both internal and external. But this question of, Shauna was talking about her grandchild before. I can't believe she had grandkids. Can you? I'm mean, just crazy. But, but, you know, what do you want for your grandkids? What do you want for your kids when they go to school in the future? Um, and on top of that, what, what do you think we need to do as a system to make that happen? So those are the two questions. Laura is out passing out some uh, index cards and some pens. And if you feel like sharing something with us, write, write your answers to these questions for us. Again, we're collecting them, we're uh, typing them up, and we're sharing them with the school board as we work on our vision statement, our mission statement, and all the goals and, and uh, strategies that we're going to use to reach those goals. So um, while I'm answering questions or anyone else in the panel is an answering questions, I encourage you to write down whatever your thoughts are to be considered by our school board as we move into this strategic planning. So I'm done with my part of the presentation but I'm willing to take any questions. I know there was one gentleman over here. I don't know if he's still here who had I, a question. I think I saw him leave. Oh. Yes. Um, does anyone have any written questions that they'd like to pass to any CP board members circulating that we can ask, answer, rather? And in the meantime, if you do have a question for the mic. Matt, I, I was um, in Nancy's first of classroom all, this morning, too. <laughs> You've had a long day, too. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to thank 
you guys and the board members for being here and for preparing this for all of us. It was great information. I love how you've thanked the community people that have um, participated. I have one point of clarification I would like to make. Um, I believe Architects West was the designers of Sorensen, not Lombard, and you. also Canfield. And I just wanted to clarify that as a thank you to, you know. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yes. Thank you for clarifying that. I'm surprised Mr. Wardell didn't grab me on that one. You do sometimes. That's okay. Thank you for clarifying that. It's very important for the TV cameras as well. So, yeah. so thank you. I have a question about the technology portion. Um, I have no worries at all about our kids being able to use computers. They do it all day long, you know, from the littlest to the, you know, the oldest. But how do we ensure the technology that we're putting in the classroom is actually enhancing their education? And it's not just, oh, great, we've got this technology, but our kids aren't getting any smarter. They're not getting a better education. put my mic on if I step into the magical T zone here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I would love to answer that question for you just because I am our school tech leader. I've been that for seven years and also the web editor. And I'm huge on technology integration actually in my master's degree. That was my area of focus was tech integration and instruction. And I, um, for the first time, have I've been fighting to integrate this little bit of technology that I've had over the years. But how do you really know if it's making the kids smarter or if they're just getting to play? And over the last few weeks, Sorensen, we just got our five iPads in the class. And so what do I say to my, my colleagues and my staff who don't have iPads? And, and what, what is really the purpose? And with, as you heard a lot about the 21st century student, and what does that mean? And there's those four C's that you'll start hearing a lot. And I've got it back on my display board back there for some of the things that are happening at Sorensen. But it's really that communication, the collaboration, being able to critically think and be creative. And so when we put iPads into the classrooms, the teachers know first and foremost, these are not for playing games. They're not for some kind of rote memorization. They're used, the, the, the power of the iPad, for example, and I'll just speak to that because that's what I have, is really in it, the cameras and the videos and the ability to be able to create things with those, the presentations. And you'll see that learning evident when the objectives are clear, what, what is the purpose of the lesson? What is the purpose of the technology? And what are you expecting them to be able to communicate and create with that? And so that's where you start being able to really measure what are they learning. It's because of what they're producing with those devices. So I hope that helps it's a little bit. Te technology is really a, you know, it's a, it's a tool for learning. You know, Hayden Meadows mm -hmm. was just mentioned that, you know, they, they're uh, starting a focus on technology, but it's not just technology for technology's sake, it's technology to enhance the learning. And, and you know, part of that is us learning how to best do that. Um, but again, part of the reality is it is the, it is the, the century, the, the age that we're living in right now. And so, you know, some people were asking questions before, it might have been you even, like how do we make sure that the kids who don't have technology at home have this experience. It is, it, it is the way of the future. Does that mean that they don't have to know how to read and write, maybe write in cursive and those things? No, but it is our responsibility to ensure that, that our students know how to navigate those things and how to navigate it responsibly. One of the things we're going Safely. to be la launching into is, is dig digital citizenship. Mm -hmm. um, because you know so many kids have access and it's such a huge world out there that can be unsafe. They can do things that aren't okay, and they can be getting into areas that aren't okay, and we need to figure out how do we help them navigate that world, because it is the world they're living in. Um, unlike the, the lady who spoke earlier, I do have concerns about the technology um, and the comfort level of some of our students, especially younger students using technology. And um, the response I keep getting or hearing from the district is, well, we're, we're getting them out there. We have 275 that we sent over to Hayden Meadows, and we have five new ones for the Sorensen. Um, but that's still not getting into all of the hands of the students. And I have a second grader who will be taking this test next year, and I already have concerns right now that it'll take him upwards of 10 minutes to answer an extended response question. So I still have concern, and I want to... I don't, I, if there are plans, for example, I like that you suggested that you have more 
you're utilizing your computer lab, your tech lab more to get your students in there. Um, why, why doesn't the district set up some guidelines for all of the teachers to do that? Because I'm not hearing that happening in my son's classroom. And keyboard familiarity, I'm hearing that he's spending his tech lab dragging and dropping, which I, I understand is going to be important with the test. But the, the extended response questions are my biggest concern, that it's gonna take these third graders and maybe some of the older kids a long time to answer these questions because they're not using the technology day in and day out to type out answers. So the specific question is how, how are we gonna ensure that kids have more access? How are you gonna ensure that every student in the school district is going to be tested for their ability to reason and their problem solving skills and not their limitations with the technology? You know, I, I don't know how I don't know how I can ensure it. Again, it's it's something that we're we are working with every uh, every uh, teacher on. We have, you know, we have uh, collaboration every Monday, and something that we really uh, appreciate the community uh, for providing to us. And we do get together um, about once a month across district, and we're providing those messages. I think that every teacher has certainly heard that message over and over again, whether it's directly from us, whether it's from their principal or from their technology leaders in the building. To, uh, Shauna just talked about how she is a technology leader in her building. We do have a director of technology. Um, we also have a technology instructional coach. We're trying to get up to speed. I mean, part of it is making sure the teachers are comfortable with it also. Part of it is making sure that uh, every school has enough technology, you know, the devices themselves. And, uh, you know, it's something that we're growing into, and you're absolutely right. <clears throat> we talked about how uh, this, year's, this year's ninth graders are going to have to pass that test. And, uh, you know, luckily, your second grader has a number of years before, although it all counts, before the, the graduation requirement is there. It's something, in, in the, with a smarter balance and with the, the Idaho Corps, in an ideal world, we would be saying, well, we're just gonna roll it out, kindergartners first year, kindergartners and first graders the next year, and keep growing it up, but we don't have that luxury. So, uh, we're, you know, we're not the only school district or state. I just read something from a Maryland newspaper that I passed along to, to Mike Nelson just to, uh, this afternoon about how it's a large district and they have, they're looking at spending millions of dollars just to get caught up. Now they weren't on a statewide test like the ISAT that required computers. So we're, in some ways we're ahead of the game, but yes, what we're, we're asking the kids to do with the computers now is, is that much more ramped up. So it's part of what we have to do. Are we there yet? No. Are we gonna get there? I, I, I would say confidently, although you know who knows where we're all gonna be, in, in nine years when your student is taking that test for graduation requirement that will be there will everyone be there well we that's always our goal to get everyone there and uh, uh, we're continuing to learn we're tr continuing to research what best practices are what other states have learned what other districts have learned and uh, getting kids into the classroom what i can suggest most of all as a parent is you advocating and uh, you know i've heard you before at, at pta alliance i appreciate your involvement is you know talking to your child's teacher talking to your child's principal as well, and talking about those things and saying these, these things are important to us. Talk in your PTA meetings and, and continue that, that conversation. And teachers know that it's important. Whether we can get them all enough time before it counts um, next year, um, that's, that's our goal. Um, I can't guarantee it because we're not standing there, uh, standing there yet, but that is our goal for, to figure out how to get uh, all the resources and all the opportunities for kids as we can. We keep advocating. And Matt, if, if there's something that I might be able to add with this as well, is that one of the unfortunate realities, one of the unfortunate realities of living in Idaho is funding. And the state allocation to the Coeur d'Alene School District for technology purposes is zero dollars. So if we want to have technology that impacts our students, we have to go to you. Now again, we are very, very thankful that you've continually supported our district. But it's because of the support that we have that we do have updated technologies and passing of bonds to be able to have. But that is something that I know our school board especially is going to be advocating to say, hey, we're trying to make this shift. We're trying to be a leader in the state of Idaho. But that is a struggle in our state is that we have to look at every piece of that pie and find out what is most important. 
and divvy it up accordingly. And that is a true challenge when we're moving to this. Other states are spending millions of dollars. The state of Washington uh, added a billion dollars to the state budget for technology purposes. We don't have that luxury here. We do need to wrap it up tonight, so we have time for one very short question. <laughs> Judge? Jean, short. Short. <laughs> I don't know short. This may sound like a lawyer question, but I'm not. If, in fact, there's economic variance economic amongst the demographics and the likelihood that a particular student will have technology at home versus one in a poorer school, why in God's name would you start at Hayden Meadows? Uh, well, that's, that has to do with our community. You know, Hayden Meadows, uh, we, we didn't start at Hayden Meadows. Hayden Meadows started it for themselves as uh, something that they decided to take uh, as a direction for themselves. So uh, the, uh, the technology focus there came from, came from them, and they happen to have an incredibly supportive uh, parent group that has uh, helped to launch that. So, uh, you know, it is our job. It's just like with individual students. How do we ensure access for everyone? Um, and, uh, you know, as, as we roll out um, the bond, you know, the technology in those buildings, some of the, some of the buildings uh, that are being rebuilt are in some of our poorest neighborhoods and are receiving a lot of technology as well in those areas as, as they get rebuilt. So um, it's one of the challenges of public schooling. You know, we, we need to make sure that we are um, uh, providing access for all, taking all comers and doing as best we can and uh, continuing to uh, improve their experience and helping them achieve to their, to their potential all the time. And, and uh, you know, sometimes it is a dollars and cents question, but why would we start at Hayden Meadows? It's because of this great community and, and the parents there that they were able to launch into that when we might have funding challenges uh, uh, back in, in at home. So. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, but we've been told because of filming we have about three minutes left, so I, we do need to wrap so, up. Norm, I, I can talk to you afterwards if you want. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Handelman, for another um, great discussion. Um, and <laughs> Just in closing, we'd again like to thank the district for partnering with us tonight and presenting some very, very valuable information. And thank you again all for coming out tonight on a very snowy evening. Um, please take a moment to visit our membership table at the back of the room and um, to learn more about becoming a member of CEP or how you can volunteer in any of our local schools that we are working in. And you may also visit our website at cdaep.org. And then also please stay tuned for some news um, from CEP about a sp spring fundraiser we will be holding to show appreciation for our local teachers. We invite you to stay to enjoy some re refreshments and visit with CEP board members and school district staff. And that might be how you can get your extra questions in. Thank you again. Please drive safely and good night. And again, there are iPads in the back if you want to see some of the Smarter Balance tests and if you have.